Well, thank you, Robert, for inviting me here and come with Brian. And it's to meet you all and to share something very simple, uh, which is a, uh, I call it a headless way. And uh, so it is a different path, if you like, from uh, other paths, but it aims at the same goal, which is you. And since you've turned up today, you've brought all you need. And uh, I hope, uh, uh, well, I will share with you some what we call experiments for taking a fresh look at yourself. So you will know the traditional idea that uh, perhaps that there are two sides to yourself, the human, which we all know all about, and the divine, the awareness, which has is quite different from your human nature, my human nature. It's infinite. It's infinitely creative. It is infinitely capacious. And, uh, and you are both, you see. So I'm here really to celebrate both, but in particular to guide our attention to our true nature. And in a very odd way, uh, perhaps a way you have not uh, thought about before, or you might have done, it's very simple. But I'd like you to, as I'm sure you will be, be open-minded and just uh, go along for the ride and we'll see what happens. So uh, I would like you just to notice that you, cannot see your own head now. I told you it was weird. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see my own head. I can't see Richard. I can see bits of my body, but I'm looking out of an open space here. Now, would you agree that you cannot see your own head? Yes, yes, I agree. It's my most. Ah. Now, when we look at our noses, I said, what is your name? Jose. Jose. Yeah. Okay, Jose. Well, this is for all because it is great, you see, because it's about testing this, about looking, you see. So you can see other people's, there's a difference between the inside and the outside. So you see my outside, I see my inside. I see your outside, you see your inside. Mm -hmm. Just okay. mm -hmm. So from the outside, everyone's nose is fairly small, right in the middle of their face. Right? But my nose goes from the ceiling to the floor. It's the biggest nose in the room. Mm -hmm. Now, close one eye, and there it is. That's huge nose. You've got the biggest nose in the room. Um. <laughs> or if you close the other eye, you've got another one on the other side. But none of them, from my point of view, are attached to the head. They just come up out. All right, so hang on in there. <laughs> <laughs> Stay open-minded, you see. So I'm going to direct. Uh, we, we were joking about this uh, yesterday, I think, that um, people talk about pointing out instructions, pointing out to your true nature, Zogchen, you know, all of this. And in the headless way, we actually point at our true nature, you see. You're smiling. You know what's coming? No? A little bit coming? Yeah. All right. So uh, I think it was Jesus who said, you know, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be like a child. Mm -hmm. So we're going to come down back to what it was like to be five-year-olds and do something simple. You know, Because if you say to a class of five-year-olds, all right, we're going to do an experiment. Anyone want to do it? Yeah, 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 yeah. You see it like, so that's the spirit. So. Take your finger and point at the carpet. So you're directing your attention. So it's very simple, but be childlike. You're amongst friends, and we're only streaming it to the universe on Zoom. So <laughs> <laughs> you needn't be worried. And look along your finger, and you notice the carpet. You can see that you're pointing at the carpet, a thing, and all the colors and shapes. And you don't have to know how the carpet was made. You don't even have to like it to see it. All right, now you point about your body, say your knee, 
And it's the same. Uh, you don't have to know how it works. Um, doesn't have to feel good. You might have a pain in the knee, but you can see it. See. And you do not have to ask anyone else, is my knee there? You look for yourself. Now, hold your finger out and point back at where others see your head. Be simple, like the child. Do you see your head there? I don't. Oh, no. 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 You see. Well, that's it. <laughs> It's, it's, it is it, but it's not the end. It's the end and the middle and the beginning. So point back, you see it. Now everyone else will see you. You can imagine what others are seeing. They're seeing you pointing at your head. But you are on the inside and you can see from your point of view, that's just distinguishing between the outside. They see your nose attached to your head, to your face. So that I see my nose, it's been in vast open space. Now point out the other hand, this is a, a, an idea I'll just use a bit, two way, two way pointing, two way attention, two way looking. And the finger pointing out is pointing at I think what the Buddha's called 10,000 things, all those colors and shapes out there. The finger pointing in, I say it's pointing at nothing. No things, space, awareness, simple. And I find no divine mind. So these are words that provisionally, in my way, describe a non-verbal experience. Now you might like this one. I am now going to tell you what this whole meeting is about. And I, I, I'm only going to say it once. I'm just joking. I'm only going to say it once. So you better listen. All right? Concentrate. I'm going to say it once. And you're going to get it exactly. Exactly as I mean it. This is transmission. <laughs> uh, I think you're all ready for the transmission. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to count down and then I'm going to say it. There's three, two, one. Transmission. Okay. It's a non-verbal experience. Mm. And I say, no, I believe no one here can see their own head. I assume that. I can't see mine, so I assume you're in the same condition. Now, what do I see instead of my head? It's like a five-year-old, five isn't it? What, what do I see? I know, I know. What, what dear? What dear? I see the world instead of my head. I see the room. I see the people instead of my head. See, oh, good. See, great. It's just as simple as that. It's as simple. And you don't have to understand it. You don't even have to like it. It's just an observation. See, now, See, I say that is the way we're built. You got you've never ever, I've never ever seen my head. I'm so take your hands like this and just you can hold them up a bit so you and you just see what's between your hands. It's a kind of gap filled with either the fan or the people or a bit of the wall. There's something between your hands there in that sense, you see. Now looking just ahead, like a child. You've got these children that enter the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus said. You slowly bring them back past either side of your head, but take your time and watch them grow bigger. You see, now you say, just stop there and say, you know, children, have your hands grown bigger? Yes, yes, sir. You know, yes, yes, they have. You know, they're not reinterpreting. Say, yeah, they're I, my hands are as big as the wall, right? Now bring them further, they get wider and apart and bigger. And now I've got the whole room between my hands. I've got the whole world in. <laughs> right? Popular songs often tell deep truths. Now keep going. Your fingers disappear. And your hands disappear all the way to probably your wrists. And you've got sensations but no hands. I'm saying. So it's up to you to describe. So I say I, my hands are disappeared in the great void. 
into the vast sky-like emptiness of your true nature, you see, all that remains is sensations in that awareness. Now bring them forward and watch them, like a child, magically come out of nowhere. See, and emerge and shrink. Like a child. Do I have to understand it? It is true. Non verbal. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this is what we all have in common. Now, one of the fantastic, beautiful, deep applications of this, because people are saying, so what? Very good question. So what? That's where uh, lots of creativity comes from. And one of the applications that I discover is that when I look at you, I see your face and not mine. So I call it face to no face. And I now say, when I look at you, well, I have your face instead of Richard. We've got trading faces. <laughs> so now, being like a child and taking what is given. I am sitting on this chair. I can't see Richard. I see a bit of his body and my little hands vaguely peeking out at the bottom, right? Seeing a big nose coming out this side. There, you see. And all of you. So I see I'm space to you. I'm not, in my own experience, face to face. See, I've got your face. I assume you've got mine. You trade plate, right? You see? It's a good deal. You swap the idea of one face, because I've never seen one, for having an infinite number of faces. This is so beautiful. When you're with people, you enjoy having their face. There's no distance. I've got your face, you've got mine, right? Yeah. Is this, don't we need, I mean, don't we? want something simple and available and beautiful and loving and not something you've got to work yourself up to and think yourself into but you just look and say ah i don't even have to think i have your face do you have mine say yes yeah. <laughs> because you see, this is so simple it is fantastic and I, uh, you see, one of the things I do, I spend my life going around sharing, uh, you know, in reminding people they can't see their own head. I mean, how weird and wonderful is that? <laughs> uh, that's my job. I mean. <laughs> I, I've started learning the piano. I'm 71. And uh, online, the person teaching, when had, was a guest teacher, I was telling Brian, uh, and they were uh, they asked, um, so what is the most important thing to, you know, if you want to learn the piano? She said, I think the most important thing is to start when you're five. <laughs> <laughs> I missed the boat. Anyway, I eventually got, uh, I've just, after four years learning, you know, no. Uh, I t found a piano teacher locally, and a few weeks ago he said to me, so what do you do? I, I teach the this way, what's that? So these are, I don't try and explain it, I just look at it and I say, oh, well, I, can see, I can't see my face, I see yours. So I, you know, and I expect, I'm looking, you, you can't see yours, you have mine. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> you need to fall, you need to fall over. <laughs> it's that easy to share. But the thing is, to live from it, you see. But, but living from it is far easier if you're in a society where it's accepted and understood and enjoyed. So I go around, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm uh, this is my life. 
I am all the time meeting people who are enjoying being face to meet us. And uh, encouraging people to own it. So, one of the uh, other ideas is a uh, single eye. And from the outside, you can see that that distance you see, that I've got two eyes. I mean, this makes sense scientifically, if you like, because you say, well, Richard, I can see your head there. I say, well, you're over there. Why do, and I'm here. I'm talking about my true nature here. I'm not talking about what I appear to be. Why don't you come up? Come closer and see what is here. So you come up to me and instead of, like a child, you see, you see that my whole body there, you get about here, you see my torso and head, you get about here, you see my head and shoulders, you get about here, you just see my face, you get closer, you see a patch of skin. Well, Richard has begun to disappear. This is relativity. What you are changes with range. And you come even closer and I'm a cell. And you come even closer and I'm a molecule. And you come even closer and I'm a particle. I've almost disappeared, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm right here and I have disappeared. Mm -hmm. I've gone. So it may, it, I, it, I complete the picture as if you're peeling the layers of an onion as you come up to me. And there's less and less and less. This makes sense. I mean, you could test it. We just, we, we this, is, this is taking on board what science says, you see. You come out, so you say, well, I see Richard. I say, of course you do from there. You see, but what, over here, I don't see Richard. But the beautiful thing is you get to nothing. And then you, as it were, look out from nothing. You see everything. I'm nothing and everything. I am nobody and I am you. I am you. I am you. Now. I say, uh, I'm looking at a single eye. And you say, well, you've got two eyes, Rich. I say, well, I do for you, but I don't for me. All right? Mm -hmm. I'm not denying your point of view, but enjoy this. You see, kids, five-year-olds, right? Hold your hands out and make a pair of binoculars or glasses, something like that. So you've got two holes with a dividing line. You've got to put them together, that's right? And now put them on and notice what happens to the dividing line. Well, the two become one, don't they? The dividing line disappears. Now take your hands and go all the way around the view. You see, that's what I call a single eye. It's not an eye, it's a space. And you can make your hands disappear into it. So returning to just being aware of the way things are doing. Now I'm going to take you through just a little exploration of this. And um, so I think that now, I, if I say, well, be aware of your single eye, you know what I'm talking about, right? Or be aware you can't see your head, or be aware it's face to no face. Now, I'm going to uh, invite you to notice several things about the single eye. Because we've been overlooking it, probably, and uh, we're going to just refresh observation. So, uh, if you look at me, you'll see I've got some kind of boundary. I'm going to call it the hard edge. It's not really a hard edge. But anyway, I'm on the inside of that edge, and the rest of the world is outside. Right? Yeah. That's it. See? Anything you look at, has a, some kind of boundary and the object is inside and things are all around this. It's inside a context, a situation environment. Yeah. All right. Now look at, be aware of the whole view, the view out. So I'll call it the view. View in, view out. View in, there's nothing. View out is the room at the moment. And be aware uh, that whatever you're looking at is right in the middle of the field of view. So I so I look at Jose and that you're in the middle, and then I look at Brian, and now you're in the middle. And I look at, uh, don't tell me, uh, Bob, and you're right in the middle, right? So it's kind of magical. You, you could reframe and say, you can make anything the center of your world. 
by just looking at it, right? Now you're the center. Now Robert's the center. Now the Buddha's the center. Now, so anyway, whatever you're looking at, in the center is most in focus. And as you're aware of the peripheral, soft eyes, wide eyes, it gets vaguer and vaguer. Would you agree? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I'd like you, as much as you can, just to be aware of that edge, field, edge of the field of view. Now, it's a weird edge. It kind of fades out. It's not a hard edge. I don't find things above it or below it or to the left or the right. It just fades into nothing. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look ahead and move your hand up, it disappears off the view, right? Well, that's what I'd say. It's going into nothing. I'm putting words on a non-verbal experience. Yeah, there you are. So I say the view is not inside anymore. Just be with that for a moment. It, it, this is about observation. I mean, it's simple. You don't have to think of it this way. But as you look at the whole view, it fades out into nothing. Does that make sense? Or describe it as you like. <laughs> <laughs> Land or landscape. <clears throat> so view. View, landscape. Also, also could use. Language. Yeah. Whatever you like, good. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the first. The three things I want you to observe is meditation, isn't it? It's attention. It's not trying to get somewhere where you're not. It's observing where you are. That, to me, that's meditation. Meditation isn't trying to change things it's observing what's given and what is given is is probably not what we were told <laughs> and what we're doing today is having a fresh look for ourselves so i say the view the landscape the view out is surrounded by nothing floating in consciousness given in wide open boundless awareness I'm putting words on that non -verbal. Second thing is if you look at two objects in the room, it, it could be me and this bottle. You can just, it, the size is relative. So you say that this bottle is smaller than Richard. But you could say it, but it's bigger than the clock. So in that sense, its size is relative. Now be aware of the whole view out. It's, you are the fades all out all the way around. How big is it? Well, there's not a second to compare it with. Do you, anyone see a second one on the right or the left? I don't use it. So it is single, it's incomparable. How wide is the view? Well, nothing to compare it with. So I say now it's as wide as this room. But if I go out at night, on a clear night, look at the stars, the view is as wide as the heavens. So anyway, so I can't say how big it is, and it's not inside anything. The third thing, are we all following here, all with me? Yeah. Yes. But third thing is um, you can estimate a difference between two objects, so between the clock and the bottle or between the, tele, the phone and the floor. You can estimate the difference between any two things. Now, look at the whole view. How far away is it? Well, from where? It's, I can't measure that way. Because nowhere to measure from. Right? So that I am putting words on non-verbal experience. You might think about it differently. Okay, so I'm now going to guide you from there into a closed eye meditation. Right? Uh, looking at the same three aspects that of size and uh, whether or not uh, it is contained and where it is. So close your eyes. And uh, be aware of the darkness. And ask yourself, how big is the darkness? 
And I say, well, there isn't a second one to compare it with. I can't say how wide it is, just as wide as it's wide. And I don't find a clear boundary to that darkness. That um, a hard edge with things on the other side, it just, if I was put into words, I'd say it just fades out into nothing, into consciousness, into space, into awareness. And where is it? How far away is it? Well, I, it's, I can't say. It doesn't seem to have an address. It's just floating in the middle of consciousness, space, awareness. And I can also hear sounds. And for the sake of communication, I'm just going to call all the sounds the field of sound. So I could say the field of darkness has no boundary, isn't inside anything, I can't give an address. And the field of sound. Where is it? Does it have a clear edge or does it? I find it, I would say, it fades out. You know, what I call distant or quiet sounds fading out into silence. Or I could say that the sounds coming out of that silence or coming into that silence. And so this tells me, tells me, you may or may not agree, it tells me that this silence is just incredibly creative because sounds are coming out of it all the time without me knowing how or even what is going to come out. And there's never a moment, this moment, when there's nothing happening, always something emerging out of awareness or into awareness. And so I come to the conclusion that this awareness that I am is just incomprehensibly fertile, creative, imaginative. And the sounds that are happening in or emerging out of this silence, the silence is another word for the space in which the darkness is happening. These are all metaphors for this mystery of your own being. And I don't find, I can distinguish between the darkness and the sounds, but I don't find a dividing line. They're both arising together in this mysterious being that we are, that is utterly, utterly simple and present, always. And uh, now be aware of your body sensations. And I'm going to call that the field of sensation. And uh, we give these sensations labels like left foot and right elbow and left ear. And I would say that we have learned to label these sensations as we've grown up. And this is just, you know, not necessary to say how important it is to be able to do that. Because if I say, be aware of your right foot, you can go to that sensation because you've got the image, you've learned to associate the image of your right foot with that sensation. Or if I say, be aware of the back of your head, well, there's that sensation and you've got, you've gone to it because you've learned that that label applies to that particular sensation. So all good. But now imagine for the sake of this exercise that you're a baby and you've just been born and you haven't even opened your eyes. So obviously you've never looked in a mirror and you don't understand language. And so you've no image yet of yourself as others see you, no image yet of your right foot or your left elbow or your head or whatever, or the shape of your body, let's say. 
but you've got the sensations, the field of sensation. So you probably can't get rid of the labels completely. I, I understand that, but just go by the sensation, the innocence of a baby, see, without having to understand or even like. Going by your sensations, how big are you? See, well, there is not a second field of sensation to compare myself with. So I can't say, how wide am I going by the sensations as if I'm a baby? Well, I have no idea, nothing to compare myself with. So there isn't a second field. So what shape am I? Do I have a hard edge that bumps up against something outside me? No, I, I find not. And these sensations are like vibration, I suppose, like uh, changing. Now, the, the, it, I could say they just come out of this mysterious awareness or come into it or happen in it without me knowing how, but there they are. And I am now settling into this experience of having no boundary, the, the feeling of having no boundary, the observation, let's say, of having no boundary, of having no defined shape, of having no edge. See, and it's comfortable. And it's what I recognize as being the way it's always been. I've always been shapeless from this, from the inside, as it were, shapeless, boundless, not contained. The bottle is contained in the room. But the field of sensation or the darkness or the sound not contained, not inside any, in awareness. So you you may think of things differently. You just if you would go along with the ride and take whatever appeals to you and, and not the rest, obviously. Now I can distinguish between the field of darkness, which has no boundary, no shape. No location. I can distinguish between that and the field of sound, but I can't separate them. They're arising together. And I can distinguish between the field of, the, of sound and the dots and the sensations, but I can't separate them. They're arising together. The sensations, the darkness. As I say, I can distinguish in, in language, but I can't separate. All arising in this undivided awareness, this boundless awareness. Now, be aware of your mind, your thoughts, your judgments, your feelings. And I'm going to, as shorthand, call that the field of mind. And uh, uh, for example, just start counting from number one in your mind and just say the words to yourself if you like or imagine the numbers and just keep going, just to have a few thoughts going, you see. Well, do you know where they come from? Do you know how you think, create a thought? I mean, it, they just come out of nowhere for me. Out of no mind, as the Buddhists call it, I think. The same mysterious emptiness, if you like, that the sounds come out of, or my voice is coming out of. One, two, three, or imagine a mountain. See, where, whoa, where did that come from? Or imagine the face of a friend. See, magic power. Now, when you think of a friend, you might feel warmth love, caring, concern. So feelings arise with the thoughts. You see. Now, where do those feelings come from? Out of the <clears> knowing, <throat> I say. So, be generally aware of whatever you're thinking and feeling. And it might be numbers, it might be what you have for breakfast, it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna call that the field of mind. It's very complicated, often unpredictable, out of your control, see? How big is the field of mind? Well, I do not find a second one to compare it with. So I, I can't 
say it's bigger or smaller, it's single, incomparable. See, how wide? These are very simple, yet justifiably ask, you know, you can ask this question, how big is my mind? See, I've been told it's only about eight inches across or something, I don't know, inside your head. But when I attend for myself, from my point of view, I cannot say, where does your mind end? Is it, has it got a clear, hard edge, so to speak? And then I just can't say. I mean, I just can't answer that. Or I can say it's boundless. It has no clear boundary. It fades into no mind, comes out of no mind, arises in no mind, whatever no mind is. And what shape is it? See, I can't say. Where is it? In awareness is the most I can say, probably. And I find that although I can distinguish between my thoughts and feelings and the sounds and the darkness and the sensation, I cannot separate them. My thoughts do not belong in a little box at center separate from the darkness or the sounds. It's all arising together. I am at large. I am big, like Walt Whitman, Whitman said. I am large, I contain multitudes. <laughs> you as a person do not contain multitudes, but you as who you really are, contain everything, I see. Everything is arising in you. Now this is just magical, wonderful, true, is returning home, being at home, And you know, uh, uh, well, socially, conventionally, you say, well, Richard's voice is outside me and say, if I've got ringing in the ears or something, that's inside, you see. All right, we understand, we've labeled one outside and one inside, that's really useful because no one can hear the ringing in your ears, but they, everyone can hear Richard's voice. So we, socially, that is important distinction. But from the inside, where is the boundary between inside and outside? The sound of the ringing in the ears or whatever you would call internal and the sound of Richard's voice or the traffic. You're sitting on a, a chair or a cushion. Where's the boundary between you and the cushion? Where, where, go to that sensation. It's the one sensation arising in awareness. I find a boundary. This is a deep, deep, deep reconnection with the world. You see, there's no boundary. I can distinguish, but I cannot separate myself from the world. It is all arising in me. And when you are listening to my voice, here's a little experiment, quite simple. You just see how you go with it. I'm going, if you start, just first part of the experiment is count again silently from one, just slowly. And as you count the numbers, imagine and not only imagine the number, but silently say the number to yourself. You know, it's like when you're reading, sometimes you, you say the words to yourself or whatever. So be aware of the image and the silent saying arises in the silence, out of the silence, I say. All this by itself, it's strange. Now, I'm going to count. And as I count, this is a way of learning a language. You, it's called shadowing. As you hear someone speak a language you don't know, you, you say it as they say it. It's a strange skill that, or power that you've got, that you, even though you don't know what someone's going to say, you can say it with them as they're saying it. And by the way, the person who is speaking, like me at the moment, I do not know what I'm going to say next. So, I mean, there's not a great deal of difference, except I've got a general feeling of the direction. But you've probably got a feeling, some kind of feeling of direction anyway. Anyway, here we go. To make it simple. I'm going to count. And as you say the word silently with me and, and even imagine the numbers, to make it simple, Observe if there is 
a division between your saying it and your hearing it? Where's the dividing line between my voice and you hearing and saying my voice? It's as it could be, can be, as if you're saying, speaking the words as I speak them. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and uh, we will be opening our eyes in a minute, but just hold on in there. Uh, I travel a lot and often have a translator, and I have the fun thing of uh, saying, well, so I was in Sp Spain last weekend, and I uh, had a translator, and I like to say, you know, and the person translates, you know, I say, I can speak Spanish fluently. And the person translates, I can speak Spanish fluently. And I'm speaking Spanish fluently. <laughs> the easy way of learning language. Okay. All right. Just let's just be quiet for a moment before we open our eyes. <laughs> you are now speaking with an English accent. <laughs> So there's always something arising, infinitely, irrepressibly created this nothingness that you are, the no dividing line. Your nature is just irrepressibly created. To look at a flower is, you could say, is to create the flower. You see it arising in your awareness. Now open your eyes. And I say that very little has changed. That now within the space has arisen you. And I say there's a kind of magic power. Five year olds. So I am now going to make the room disappear. Now I'm going to make it rip. So exercise your magic power. Close your eyes. In other words, make the room disappear. Magic power. Shiva, the power of destruction and creativity. This is a metaphor for your true nature. As a child, as a child say, oh gosh, I've made you all go. Now open your eyes or recreate. You enter the kingdom of heaven as a child. You take it as it's given freely. Yes? Yes, yes. Now, one of the ways of growing with this in our lives and deepening it and stabilizing it and living from this, uh, uh, you will discover if you're interested in this, you will you'll find a way. But, um, here, is, here are some thoughts that I've picked, you know, some discoveries I've made on the way. And with many friends, I'm many friends I share this with, is totally normal, totally 
equal. I cannot see my headlessness more clearly than you. I mean, how ridiculous. But you will think about it differently from me. Good. But um, I came across this more than 50 years ago. So I've lived with this for 50 years. And I came across it when I was a teenager. Through, I met a man who developed it, who presented it, Douglas Harding. See? And he always used to say, come and visit to everyone. The first time I visited, only a few months after I first met him, my mom and my brother, uh, the people had just had lots of friends. And I just hung out. I used to go every other weekend almost, and then went, did workshops, traveled with them, came to the States in 74, did workshops. And so I, uh, as soon as I saw this, I thought, whoa, that, that, that is what I'm looking for. Now, very amusingly, I, I uh, just last week, uh, I'm always sharing it for people. And, and that nowadays, I'm old enough not to care. You know, they'll say, you know, in the, in the shop, they'll say, so what do you do? I say, oh, well, I show people that you can't see your own head. Instead, you have the other head. You see, no shame, no shame, you see. But I, I now act as if it's totally normal and, you know, available. So why not? I'm not making a big thing of it necessarily. I'm just saying, I've got your face now. How wonderful. I love having your face. <laughs> Takes years off me. Yeah. <laughs> you see? <laughs> But um, I did, I, I, um, I had to go to a picture framing shop <coughs> with a picture that Douglas Harding had drawn and it was a first person picture. So it was his headless body looking from here, drew, drew it with his face in the mirror, see. And I had to have this sort of taken out and then reframed. And Douglas had given me it years and years ago. It was a big picture. And uh, the lady in the shop, Looked at it, whoa, she, wow, that's amazing. I've seen some amazing pictures, even Picasso, but that is special because it is very dramatic. The, I mean, you, in the picture, the shoulders of Douglas are as wide as the bottom frame. Well, just look. Someone else's shoulders are very narrow, but look at your own. Mine go, mine are as wide as this wide room. And then my body taped, right? Now, when you see that in the picture, and he's drawn it so it kind of fades out because it's not really in focus, is it? So you, she said, wow, that, because I mean, it immediately reminds you of your own view, you see, and not many people talk about that or take it seriously. And she said, so what do you do? And I, you know, well, you know what I said. <laughs> and she went, oh, actually, she said, uh, 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 oh, there's some things that are so obvious you never think about it. Mm -hmm. Well, then we were thinking about it. Well, I had to go in a week later to pick up, well, uh, uh, it's a bit complicated. I had to go in a week later. And we were talking, and I said, Oh, yeah, I'm going to America. She said, Oh, what are you doing there? I said, The headless way. She said, Oh, what's that? And I said, oh, well, it's it noticing you can't, you know, I, t I said, I told you before, it's about noticing you can't see your head. And said, she said, oh, yeah. You know, I don't think she thought about it once since. Now, as soon as someone showed it to me, I thought, I can't stop thinking about that. That, <laughs> that is so important. It's so all different. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> All right, I'm going to just give you another framework. So I've given you a framework of science in terms of observation of what you are, because the basic question of this meeting, as far as I'm concerned, is what am I? What am I? And there's a difference between what you are for others at a certain range and what you are at zero. It makes sense, relativity. And as I said, what you are at about six feet, 10 feet, 15 feet is a person. I'm a person sitting on a chair, I get that. But how do I know that? Because I can't see that. I know that by going out, turning around and seeing myself through your eyes, right? Self-consciousness or imagining that because I can't see it. Now, uh, when, uh, here are the 
different context, a developmental context, four stages of your life, baby, child, adult, and seer. The baby's headless. If you were a baby and they put you on this chair, you would have no idea of what you look like, you wouldn't care. You'd just be looking, you wouldn't be wondering, I wonder if my, if I've got jam on my, <laughs> you, you, you would, you'd just be open, understood? You wouldn't, that, that's the way we came in. And you just look at something you see and you wouldn't feel under inspection. You wouldn't feel, we all know that when you're looking at a baby, you, you don't feel worried about what it's thinking about you, do you? Because you know it's just haven't had no idea of what it looks like. So it's just looking as if you're wallpaper, right? In a no charge, they've got charge, self-conscious. You just you know, you've no idea of being under inspection. The eyes don't have the power yet, the charge, Medusa. <laughs> Medusa was the gorgon with snakes for hair. And, per and uh, Perseus, I think it was, had, his job was to kill her. But you can't look at Medusa because she'll turn into stone. So what he did was he picked up on his journey a mirror, a shield, which is like a mirror. And instead of looking at her directly, where you become a thing, you become solidified, petrified, which means frightened. He looked in the mirror, so it's indirect and then he could kill her. The mirror is a symbol potentially of your true nature. So when you're a baby, you're looking at these eyes and they're not yet Medusa. They have no power to thing you, to make you into a cell. Yeah? So if you're a baby sitting here, you're not worried about what people think about you because you've no idea yet of all the stories of, you know, you're looking at someone and they're going, <laughs> you know, and you're going, that person really doesn't like me. <laughs> right? What you're doing is you're just looking at that interesting face. You're not making a story up because, I mean, in a sense, there's no one out there yet. You're alone. You're the one. You see, in the beginning, there was nothing. And then there was the one. And the one went, where did I come from? Whoa, I've just happened. I have no idea. This is a metaphor for you. Your awareness, not you as a person, but your true nature. Where did it come from? Who made it? There's no answer. You, but you could say, I am that, I am that, yet I have no idea how I am, where I came from, how I did it, but I did. That is self-evident. The world may be a dream, but I'm not because I am. I cannot prove it. And this is the basic joy you are as the one you see. So as a baby, you're a bit like that. You're like the one. Ah, there you are, this one, you see. Now, from day one, through language, your parents and gestures indicate that they can see you. They're very basic, but simple. See, they say, looking at you, we see a little baby. Tiny bit baby. If you could talk, you go, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm not little. I'm big, right? I'm big. See, I have no shape. Wait. No, you're a baby. And if you want your food, you better accept this, right? Oh. <laughs> There's no option. You be, you take on board what they say. You can't see it. They can't prove it. But you accept it because you want to belong. And you want to join in the game. You see? And they look, point at the mirror. And they say, you see that little baby face there? Well, that infant face there, that is what we see here. And they point at, you, at what the place you're looking out of. You say, well, I don't see that. No. I say, I, I, all I get is sensations here. So the sensa so sensation, so yeah, but look in the mirror. So you imagine this, look in the mirror. And you see the mouth there. And there's no sensation in the mouth. 
but there's a sensation floating here like Cheshire Cat's smile, right? Mm -hmm. The sensation, where is the sensation now if you're a baby? It's kind of floating over by the wall. Are you with me? Oh, you can't pin it down. They say, that image of the mouth there belongs on that sensation. So every time you feel that sensation, feel your mouth now, you've learned to imagine your mouth. Because before that, when you took the ice cream, you went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to learn to marry the image of your mouth, your forehead, the back of your head, your elbow, your right foot, all of that to the sensation. Go to your right foot now. You couldn't do that as a baby. Now you've looked in, potentially looked in the mirror, looked at a photograph, you looked at other people's right legs, you've learned the idea of right leg. Now go to that sensation, you clothe it with the image, right? You didn't do that as a baby. So you, you take on board what others say you are from there. All right. So at the first stage, you have a baby, no idea at all, carefree. We love babies in the sense that they give us permission to drop our faces. Mm -hmm. The child is you're learning to take on board that feedback. You are a person. They point at you that you are a person. You're separate. You're born and you'll die. And as a child, you're beginning to take that on board and that enables you to participate because you understand why people are looking at you because you can't see anything. But as a child, you haven't quite got in the box yet. So it's a carefree time when you're about five where you're still open and, and nothing and everything, but you're learning to operate as if you're a person so you have the best of both of them. Third stage, by the time you're an adult, now, all of us, you are out there seeing yourself through the eyes of others. And through the eyes of others, you're a person. And I say at that third stage, you accept what others say you are, and you overlook your nothingness. You overlook your point of view. You sell yourself. You trade your inheritance for a bowl of soup in the Bible, for a bowl of porridge. So it's in every tradition, you, you sell your soul to the devil. You give up your true nature and become a person. You shrink. And now you act as if deeply you're separate face to face. You look at others now and you have a deep feeling that you are face to face. And they're seeing you. You, you can't, I can't see how you can avoid it. You feel under inspection. You feel you're a thing. Mm -hmm. And now here I am sitting on this chair as an adult thinking all these people are looking at me. I can't tell what they're seeing, but I, you know, I hope it's okay. Mm -hmm. And I am Richard and you're, you know, we're so. So that's the third stage where you deeply take on board and take responsibility for being a separate person. Absolutely vital to function in society, you see, to cross the road, to do your taxes, to do a job, to have friends. But don't stop there. You keep growing. And the next stage is where you look again and reawaken to your true nature, to being spacious, to having no boundary, to being face to no face, to being now, for me, sitting on this chair with two little hands coming out of nowhere, a voice coming out of nowhere, yeah. my single eye, you're all in me. Yet at the same time, I'm still aware of being rich. So now you have both. It's not being in denial of being a person. You're not trying to go back to the baby. So. so. So how are we doing? <laughs> See, one of the um, things that I enjoy about this is um,
well, let's do something. So, how many are one, two, three? I think we can do it. So, let's stand up, please. So, we're going to do the no head circle. <laughs> you won't be able to see it. So, we stand around in a circle. So, stand around in a circle, then put your arms around each other and look down. So looking down, we call this a no-head circle. So you look down at your body. And you can see, obviously, your feet, your legs, your torso. But I'm assuming you're like me. Your body fades out above your chest somewhere into a single eye, into this boundless awareness. So you could say your body comes out of the single eye, out of the one, out of awareness, out of the void. Now look down at the middle of the circle on the carpet there. And so you can see the circle of feet, the circle of bodies. And notice, I, I suggest, that all the bodies fade out around about waist or chest level. And they fade out into the same space at the top as your body disappears into. So I say down there we're many and we're different and distinct, but at the top we're one. For I find no dividing lines in that space of time. And all the bodies come out of this space. And there were many at the top of me. And you may think about it differently. I think the basic experience is the same for us all, but we articulate it, think about it, feel about it. Many bodies coming out of one consciousness. Down there were many at the top of the So there is no name on this consciousness at the top. No gender, no nationality, no age, no differences, no divine. Down there, yes. So we have both. Yeah. All right, let's sit down. I love that. What do you love about it? I just feel it. it uh, one time you just said the word cathedral right at the end. It's like a cathedral. It's like a sacred temple, you know, to be able to just experience the, the beauty in and out um, with others with others and with no dividing line with mm -hmm. others because the dividing line you go to work and the dividing lines there you know people are othering you and you know we've got to give them something on a certain timeline and but here it's just uh the many in the one and uh, now, even though we're not in the circle of it, it's the same, isn't it? Yeah. Many and one. And now as we're talking, I hear your voice and I hear mine, but both arise in the one consciousness, true? True. Yes, yeah. so on the one hand, I can say Richard is talking to Robert, understood, necessary, obviously. But on the other hand, I can say both voices are mine. I'm speaking with two voices. Would you agree? I agree. And yeah. it's amazing how clear you can heal from that, that separation. And that, yes. How healing it really heals and how quickly it happens. Yeah. It's just amazing. I know. And <laughs> mysterious and creative and wonderful. I mean, I, I, I'm talking with your voice. I don't know what I don't know what you're really going to say, right? There's a, there's a song by Kabir. Uh, Kabir was a mystic. Yeah. Uh, I sell mirrors in the city of the blind. Ah. <laughs> oh, that's his job description. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Any other reflections to share? People's feet are not into. Pardon? People's feet are not into. Working with people. Yes. 
You didn't know whose feet belonged to him. Yeah. Is that a nice feet? <laughs> you know who I would say, you know who they really belong to. <laughs> the one, yes, yes. My reflection is, and I, I'm going to share this in a different way than we talked about over breakfast this morning, but rather than the void, I, I another way I could say is of not Brian. That these feet belong to not Brian. From this perspective, yeah. From your perspective, of course, they belong to Brian. Yeah. And that's enough for me. Yeah. Just dropping the personality. I can have the personality for for everyone else, but yeah. for myself, yeah. I don't need that. No. I don't need the burden. No. Of that fixed static Understood. personality. Yes. So from here, there's not Brian filled with the world. Yes. Well, um, Douglas Harding wrote a book in 1960, I think uh, I may have told you, and um, called On Having No Head. And the first chapter describes its experience. And I think it's in the third chapter, he said, well, I had two first immediate realizations from this experience. I mean, he was writing it up 20 years after the event. So, so the, the, the two realizations, first of all, I confronted no one. It was anyone I looked to. It was not face-to-face -face and it was face to nobody. I confront no one. This is very deep. It was very deep way of living. Very deeply different. You confront no one. This is the truth. Is not pretending. You do not confront anyone. Look at anyone. I talked to someone yesterday in the workshop. She said, you know, I don't think I'll ever be able to talk to anyone now without seeing I'm a space. Not confrontation. No dividing line. This is seeing, not thinking. This is before thinking. Thinking comes out of this. Now, this is very deep. Very beautiful. Everyone you look at, I say that face is mine. I'm empty for you. So you to take the rest of my life to take that in and live. In. So the first realization is that I confront no one. I mean, that is enough, almost. But the second, he said, he empathized to me, as it were, and put himself in the shoes of others. And he said, oh, So I must assume that you're in the same condition. And you're headless. You're looking at the single eye. You do not confront anyone. And just as I see that the room is in me, and it is a feeling if, that goes with it, that the arm, your arms around the universe, very friendly. An image in Buddhism, I think, for your true nature, is a mother hen who has her wings around her chicks. Now, if you're a chick, you feel safe. You feel love. Now, your true nature has its invisible arms around the whole world, around this room, around all these people, including yourself. See, the world is within you. Literally, I see it. So, as I said, I must assume that you're in the same condition that the world is in you, like it is in me. And therefore, I must think the world of you. Isn't that beautiful? I think I must. This is namaste. This is the two become one. The two become one. And I honor the reality, the truth, the visible truth that uh, I am space for you and you are space for me. That everything is in me, everything is in you. There is one here, there's one and many. Now, because we've forgotten this, the prodigal son, because we've been away to the far country, 
because we've been into the land of the mirror and identified with the one there and become that one. So in the Christian story where the prodigal son leaves the father's house and goes to the far country and becomes an Egyptian and because eats and drinks like an Egyptian is the story. And then falls on hard times and has no money. His father's very rich, no money. You think, ah, oh, I've made a mistake. So I, I hope I can go back home and be received back home. I will go back and just be a servant. I don't mind. I want to go home. And he headed back home. And before he got home, his father came out. And welcome you. Come back. And the, the, the kind of meaning in that for me is that when you go back, when you come back home, having been away as if you've been away, you see home for the first, for the fresh, as if for the first time, fresh. So now you're different than the baby. You've always been at home. You've never been away from your true nature. But it's as if you've been away, as if I've been away. And it's as if I come back in and see it freshly and celebrate it. And the thing about home uh, is uh, you, here we are. We, we, at home, you, you have your friends who are aware of being at home. And you can talk to them about, it. isn't it wonderful to be boundless, Brian? Yes. Yet, you see? Isn't it wonderful to see yourself out there but not here? Yeah. Isn't it wonderful to have many voices? I mean, how wild is that? To share your true nature because it is the most obvious thing. Not him. Looking out of it. Face to no face, you see. Single eye. And uh, it, 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 you go deeper and deeper with the simple truth. So one has always been in this space. I call it home. The space is home. But what is emerging in it is changing all the time. It's like the decoration. The decor is changing. But you never go, you can never move away from nothing. Right? You see. So I say, I'm at home. I'm at home. You see. Uh, but I'm not looking out into my London home. See, temporary. I'm looking out into my Washington home. And in fact, you are all guests now in my home. Now, that's a very good way of living, isn't it? This is true. Yeah. Yes. I remember, I think it was in science, uh, one of Douglas's books, Science of the First Person, and he uses. Uh, uh, arithmetic to an equation and he says one plus one would equal two but that's from that adult perspective yeah uh, looking time. back yeah but one plus zero equals one and that was profound to me yeah just putting it in Mathematics. Simple. Simple Deep. mathematics. Yeah. What about the whole group? What about like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? Like, in zero, 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 I see what she means. Yeah. Well, you can't pin it down. These are every way of thinking about it as, you know, a limitation, right? But I mean, they you say, well, the one is many. The one is many, 26. Now you say, well, how can the one be many? I don't know. But it's true. It seems to be true. I'm going to live as if it's true. I'm enjoying the feeling that you are separate from me. I don't know you, who you are. At the same time, I'm aware I have your face and your voice is mine and you're in me, right? The paradox. This is 
this is a wonderful way to live, exciting, fresh. And what you said it sounds a lot like Alan Watts. I'm listening to a lot of Watts. But um, one way I enjoy it is that every point on the circle is the center of the circle. Yeah. So if you are a point on the circle, and because you're the center of the circle, you can understand the perspective of somebody else who is also the center of their yeah. circle or a circle or our circle. And so in appreciating yourself and everything that you deal with and everything that makes you draw at this point of the circle, mm -hmm. I now understand that you, 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 and you, because you are the center of a circle and the difference the different perspectives and all of those things become one because you are the center of a circle as well. So once you get that and internalize that, then it becomes maybe a journey to appreciate other points of the circle. Beautifully so there are millions and millions of circles, and there's all these perspectives that you can appreciate at some point. Because once, but you have to do the work of understanding yourself as, 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 as your center. When you understand that, you can begin to understand how you want to do it individually, collectively, but you understand the infinite points in the circle that are the center of the circle from beings to animals to things, everything that is at the point of the circle, you can relate to it because. You are the center. Yes. Master. Copy that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, along those lines, uh, I don't know your name. What would you think? So um, when you're a baby, you are living from your center and you've not developed awareness of others. You're not self-conscious, so you're not seeing yourself. Growing up is learning to go out, turn around, see yourself through the eyes of others. In other words, that's the, developing the ability to shift center to their center, to see the world and yourself from their point of view. It's empathy. And growing up is the development of empathy. Self-consciousness is empathy because you are appreciating who you are from another's point of view. So as you, now as an adult, you are able to shift center in that empathic, empathetic way, right? So you look at someone and you say, ah, oh, you know, you look happy, you look sad, or you, you, can, you can sense, you just instinctively read them. Yeah, so and they're reading you. Now, when you see who you are, you do the work on yourself. You see that you're wide open, space of the world. Now you develop your empathy. So now I am empathizing with you and empathizing that you're looking out of past openness. Mm -hmm. You are the one. You are looking at the single eye. Everything is in you. Paradox on paradox. So, um, one other thing just to say is that this observation is just uh, very simple and um, uh, It's like meditation, I suppose, that uh, if you decide to learn to meditate and you sit down on your cushion and you do it for three minutes and then go, well, I didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Someone will say, you've got to give it more time, right? So you give it more time. And you get as high as a kite. Mm. You see, and you go, whoa, this does work, you see. You say, oh, I'm going to go and go in back the next day to sit again, you know, you know, ready for the ride, and nothing happened. Mm. Oh, my God, it doesn't work. And someone says, 
it's going to go, it's going to change, it's going to go up and down. And the practice isn't holding on to the highs. The practice is being present with what happens and receiving and learning and surrendering, right? And you begin to realize that when you go up, you're going to come down. When you go down, you're going to come up. And when you gain, you're going to lose. And this is the natural, but there'll always be something happening. Same with headlessness. See, you see, you've no head. So you try it for an hour. You go, well, that didn't do anything. You think, all right, I'm going to try it for a bit longer. Go, oh my God, everything's in me. I'm facing no visitors. I am you. Oh my God, I was never born. I Wow, I'm going to do this now for the rest of my life. You see, you get up the next day ready. <laughs> oh, it doesn't work. Well, you see, hang on in there. But what I, I suppose, finally, I might say, and uh, yeah, it is um, in terms of keeping it going, if you're drawn to it. Uh, it, well, it's like you already understand. It, uh, if you want to, you will. It will grow in you. If you, if that is alive in you, it will grow. And feed the flame. Feed, water the root, you see. Um, but the mechanism for stabilizing it is not obscure. When you're growing up, how did you become aware that you were a person through others. How, when you, how did you stabilize your sense of separate identity? You hung out with others who were telling you 24 seven you were a person. So you could not get out of it, right? And you gave as good as you got. You joined in the communication and said, you're a person too, all right? So you participate. So by the time you're an adult, totally got it, right? No, you do not get up in the morning and wondering, oh, oh my God, that stabilized thing, Richard. You know, who am I today? And, uh, you know, it, it, it's so deep in you. And that's social, right? That's social. So then you say, so how do I now Stabilize my being aware, living from my true identity. Hang out with others who are aware of their true nature. And they will remind you. Not They'll remind you that you're a person, but they'll also remind you you're the one because they're enjoying it. They, When they look at you face to no face, you can hardly forget that you're face to no face, right? I mean, it just becomes second nature, like taking on your personal identity. So it is skillful to hang out in a Sangha community, have friends who are aware of this and who uh, enjoy communicating about it. And so I say, uh, uh, stay in touch with us if you want. You know, um, draw on that resource. So are, are non-humans are non-humans aware of that too? I mean, yeah, like non horses or dogs or birds. All of them. Yeah. It <laughs> includes everything. Everything. The floor is saying, I am the one. <laughs> <laughs> everything is alive. Any questions, reflections? Yeah, I was gonna ask um <clears throat> So you say hang out with the, you know, the people that share that, but could somebody have this insight without the language that you just used to describe it? In other words, like a dog. Of course. Right. So you, you can discern kind of, it doesn't have to be a headless. Well, you, uh, it's a paradox, you see. You see, when you see your headless, you kind of, you don't have to prove it. You don't have to have anyone agree. Uh, you kind of do it for them. I mean, my looking at you, I've got your face. The space isn't mine. 
who I, it's ours or I, language it's it in different ways you see so no no some of my best teachers are dogs the world itself is not hard the world itself is very simple it's putting it into words that's complicated the things that animals do the things that we do the things that we are everything is what it is when you attempt to describe it, you have a finite number of words, and you have to put it to literature, and you have to classify it, and you have to give it a name. But these things are just. Yes. Yes. You were going to say something? I wanted to ask about um, development, because you were talking about the way that children are um, babies would ideally be consistently recognized um, as themselves to build a stable ego. We know that doesn't happen for some people, right? You grow up in um, different situations, and so what what happens then if that um, development of the self doesn't go through that stage? And you know, sometimes they react to the baby as if it is a baby, but sometimes it's an object, or sometimes they don't respond to it. You know, these these kind of attachment related traumas in psychology that people talk about as disrupting, you know, the stable ego. Then how would that person eventually? come to a realization of themselves or would they be kind of stuck in you know do, do, do you see what I'm saying? Yes uh, well I I, uh, uh, I think people are learning as we go along how to cope and how to respond to uh, children in that kind uh, who whose development is interrupted in that way. So there's no magic bullet, bullet obviously. There's compassion and there's uh, learning how, how best, especially with the individual, to, to cope with that. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, slightly related, I have a friend in Holland, and she, um, her mother was, uh, deep into non-dual philosophy and the, with the idea that there was no self right and so as as my friend grew up her mother would not allow her to use the word I now this totally confused her so at home you couldn't use the word I but everyone at school used it and in fact uh, she said to me, it was only when she came across the headless way that both were validated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, it just absolutely sensible, vital to, you know, I'm, I'm deeply aware of Richard. I own Richard. And it does not interfere with seeing who I really am. That's the thing. It's not a choice. It's both go together. Um, and uh, sometimes people say, well, Richard, how would you tell children this? I said, I don't think so. Because you're the child is in the phase of putting their head on. <laughs> <laughs> That's the job. Yeah. Now, uh, if you are a parent who is aware of being headless, so to put it in these terms, being of who you are, um, the, actually, it's a very loving thing, isn't it? A very loving thing. Very totally, you don't have to say anything. It's a non verbal thing. I have your face, see, I'm saying something, but the experience of non verbal, of unity, of no division. And that is the most important thing. The non verbal being of it with your child or with the other, with the person in the shop. Now, if the child one day asked something about that. You see, I mean, put it in very simple terms. Mom, why don't I have a head? And everyone else does. To put it, I mean, sometimes it does happen. You'll go, oh, it's all right, dear. You, you don't for yourself, but you do for us. Mm. All right? And the child goes, oh, okay, and then runs off. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't say anything else, right? Because otherwise it becomes a thing, right? Now, uh, if you then put the other kind of 
possibility that the parent is unaware of their true nature, right? And the child goes, Mom, why don't I have a head and everyone else does? Oh, don't be silly, dear. Of course you have one. That's nonsense. Don't be stupid. Do you see how now you've repressed that? Uh, because out of the, you know, not being malicious, but you just don't know. Uh, so uh, if you have the good fortune to be around people who say yes to this, but don't have to tell you, don't have to make, especially as a child, this is love, you see, and this is freedom, and they're not making a thing of it and not putting your agenda on someone. I have a friend uh, in Poland, uh, New Zealand guy, is married to Polish lady, and um, she is not interested in headlessness. In fact, she's forbidden them to talk about it now. <laughs> <laughs> but every so often, she'll look at him and she'll say, you're doing it, aren't you? <laughs> And I add, you mean loving you? <laughs> yeah. What you described the way that I got it is the delusion that we everybody have about the body perceptions and also the um, sensation. And this finally is it being reduced to or dissolved into the infinite consciousness. Is that what you're trying to mean? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that infinite conscious consciousness means that doesn't change is sort of ever yeah. maybe after some. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You see, uh, Jesus said, build your house on a rock, not on sand. You find that rock, that unchanging reality, the ground of being, you see. Nothing will shake that. I mean, it's not a personal thing. My, you, you personally will get shaken. You have back of you this which is the rock, the ground, uh, the light. The awareness is synonymous with the infinite consciousness. Yes, yes. You see. So, you live from that non-verbal. And uh, I, uh, I'll tell you one more story. Then um, you see, uh, the response really is hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a, a lady in the sixties called Jane Goodman. She's still yeah. around. And she studied chimpanzees. She's a world authority on you know, taking care of chimpanzees and all of that. And she went to East Africa when she was a teenager back in the 60s to study chimpanzees now, alongside a guy called Leakey who was studying the bones uh, and seeing if there was a connection between humans and apes. And she was studying the behavior of chimpanzees to see if you could identify similar behavior which would indicate support theory that somewhere way back we were the same and we divided but we kept the same traits you see and uh, she uh, was watching her on tv some years ago and she was talking about observing the chimpanzees wild chimpanzees they, they used to go look at this waterfall and they did not go and drink or eat or sleep they just stood and looked and they as they looked did a little dance like you know, you move from foot to foot. Well, she interpreted it as a dance, and she interpreted further. So, I understand it's an interpretation, but this is her. She spent time with them. You know, she empathized with them, and she said that I think that when the chimpanzees were looking at this waterfall, they uh, they could see the water was always coming in. And the water was always going out, but the water was always there. See, how can that be? Always coming in, always going out, yet always there. And she said, in the face of this mystery, they dance. Mm -hmm. So I say, looking out of the great void now, into the present moment, this room, present moment is always coming in. It's always going out. And it's always there. 
And in the face of this beautiful, inexplicable mystery, I think that for me, the best response is not to write a thesis, but is to dance. Mm. I love dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, a real pleasure oh, I mean, I, uh, to be with you and be you uh -huh. and host you in my home <laughs> <laughs> and to enjoy having many voices and to have my invisible arms around you all. You see. And I'm hanging out. I'm not in a rush. But we we no normally rush. finish at 11, do we? Yeah. Yeah, but we're just hanging out and I'm happy to hang out. So.